Hi everyone, I'm Professor Sarah Rankin and I'd like to invite uh, to welcome you once again to Imperial's COVID-19 lockdown lessons. So today is lesson two and we will be hearing later from students in the Department of Chemical Engineering about how they've been working in labs making industrial quantities of hand sanitizer both for the NHS and care homes. Um, first of all I'm going to introduce uh, Margarita. So Margarita is join us, joining us from her home in Greece. Hi Margarita. Hi Sarah. Hi. Hi, Margarita was um, one of my master's students last year and uh, she has offered to be a moderator for this session. So she's going to be checking for questions that you are posting in the chat. Um, but tell me, Margarita, how's it going in, in Greece? I mean, it's strange to have suddenly be back home and I'm, I'm missing being in London and studying at Imperial, but I'm trying to keep in touch with people uh, remotely and I'm just trying to finish my studies and working in at Imperial Live lockdown sessions. Yeah, so you're finishing off your dissertation. Good luck with that. And really, thank, thank you for you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for joining us and moderating today. So Margarita's um, going to be here, and obviously, as I say, she's going to be monitoring, looking for your questions in the chat. So please ask us questions. Um, just to say that we are going to have a quiz in um, at some point in these talks. So please join the um, Mentimeter so you can answer that um, question. Um, I'd like to now introduce you to Path. Um, Path is one of the chemical engineering students with us today. Uh, Path, can you start by telling us exactly why did you choose chemical engineering? Because this is obviously something you don't have in your sort of school studies. Um, and then tell us really what is, chem what is chemical engineering? Right. Um, first of all, um, thanks so much for having me, and I'm and I'm glad to be to be here and just talking a little bit about chemical engineering and my 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 journey through it. Um, so just a little bit uh, about me. Uh, I grew up in Mumbai, in India, and like maybe many of the people watching, I um, I was interested in science in school. I studied it in school um, and at high school. And then um, when it came to kind of choosing what I wanted to do, um, I, I kind of had some options in front of me. So I grew up, uh, maybe if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, I grew up in, in, an, in an environment kind of surrounded by science. My mom was a microbiologist. My father was an electrical engineer. And um, since I was a child, they used to kind of encourage um, the curiosity that I had. And that then led me to want to consider studying um, engineering because for me, my 18 year old self, it just meant looking at large factories and systems and actually producing things that I could see, things that I could feel, things that I could touch, like tangible impact in making, making new products and the world um, a better place. Um, so then when, when I had the choice to decide what I wanted to study, I, I arrived at chemical engineering as a process of elimination. Uh, I looked at you know civil engineering, uh, but then ruled it out because it involved a lot of site work and it's not something I really wanted to do. Um, I looked at computer science and I didn't want to sit in front of a computer writing code all day. Uh, mind you, these are very simplistic thoughts of an 18 year old. So this is uh, there's a lot more to everything, but this is how kind of I used to think about it. And then I considered mechanical engineering, but my drawing was really poor, so I left that. And electrical engineering, despite my dad being one, was a complete no-no because uh, ch poor childhood memories of electric shocks left me scarred. Let's put it this way. And so I said, okay, chemical engineering seems interesting. You know, you make uh, they, you know, you make products that that are in used in everyday life, and and so uh, it's something that I decided to start uh, at at studying at university. And then um, I went on uh, to, to, studying, to studying the course. And then I realized what chemical engineering actually is, um, as you will on the next slide. And uh, first of all, it's not chemistry. So what is it? 
um, it's mainly applying the basic principles of physics, chemistry and biology and using them along with mathematics to create a framework and to create uh, a deeper understanding of how physical processes work and we use these and 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 leverage these to produce chemicals which are you know the plastics that you use in your bottles uh, materials for batteries for cars for cell phones and even like standard things that you use you see every day like you know the petrol and the diesel which goes into your cars but also um, you know medicines pharmaceuticals are all made with chemical engineering principles in mind and they made in factories where chemical engineers um, contribute to developing these processes. But it's not only about making this, it's also about remembering um, that these these processes, uh, this manufacturing needs to be done safely. It needs to be done on a large scale. It has to be environmentally friendly and it also has to be cost effective uh, so that you know people can uh, do it at a relatively low cost and companies can make money. Um, on to the next slide. Um, so how, how do we do this? We we look at uh, processes and we develop them at a lab scale. Um, so the first photograph you see is of, of a laboratory and this is typically what undergraduate chemical engineers do in their first first couple of years. Um, so what we do is we we work in a laboratory, we develop uh, processes and understanding at a small scale. And then in years three and four, we take that onto a slightly larger scale, which is called a pilot scale. And, and a picture of like a pilot scale equipment in blue there is, is, is shown in the next photo. And then with this knowledge, uh, we go out into the real world and then we develop processes with this knowledge at the large scale uh, and the photograph there of a plant with you know the, the red and white windsock is of a plant that I was part of in my working life um, after my bachelor's degree and it's a plant that I helped start. So this is a personal photograph from a personal experience um, and, and all the things that I had studied kind of fell into place. Uh, and so this was kind of my moment of you know realizing how all the dots connected to quote Steve Jobs and on to the next slide. So how do we develop processes particularly? Uh, so of course we do lab work, but that's not the only thing. We also use computational tools um, and, and, and software and fundamental equations to model natural phenomena, which can then be used to understand how fluids move. So there's a picture of actually a first year undergraduate experiment. And um, and and that's that's an example of uh, of how let's say some fluids move through through an obstruction and this this knowledge is helpful to understand how we can develop reactors uh, which is a photograph on the on the bottom left and you can see uh, you know it it helps us understand how equipments mix and then react together and it's also used to separate fluid mixtures which are gas and liquid and so on and, and and these are all fundamental chemical phenomena or sort of fundamental processes and phenomena which we study and then use um, at larger scales to actually get the products we need at the purities we want. Next slide. But chemical engineering is not just about you know refineries and and plastics and petrol. Uh, it's a continuously evolving field. So when the when the entire field was started, it used to be just you know mainly oil refineries and large scale sort of basic, basic chemical plants, and that's a photograph of a typical refinery. But nowadays, um, the with with new uh, with new applications and with newer amounts of computational power which we have at our disposal, we are using uh, we we develop software as well to to understand processes and model them. So we can do experiments on a computer as opposed to always having to go into a laboratory and do them. Um, and you can think about it like, you know, video games for chemical engineers. That's 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 one way of looking at it. And then we're also looking at next generation materials like like, you know, newer batteries which power the next generation of electric cars and help 
contribute to a lower carbon future and do our bit for the fight against climate change. And we also use these chemical processes and the fundamental knowledge that we have to develop uh, vaccines and uh, pharmaceuticals and new therapies. And, and this is just like an example. And the field is always in flux. It always moves and it moves with the times and it moves with uh, with with trying to to keep up with with the demands of the market. The most important thing is, especially given the environment we're in and and how we owe a debt and a responsibility to the environment is to develop processes which are in line with the sort of green chemical chemistry principles uh, which have been you know discussed and described in the past and there's a picture of what these what these principles are and broadly what what it means is that you when you are designing a process or redesigning a process you should always try to you know use less toxic materials less toxic solvents prevent waste make the process as safe as possible um, use catalysts which speed up the reaction uh, you know have better analysis uh, minimize accidents and try and use renewable feedstocks um, so a lot of the things which are which are being talked about uh, today uh, from a policy standpoint as well and this brings me to to my research so I work on synthesizing uh, magnetic nanoparticles. So nanoparticles are uh, particles which are roughly one hundredth the width of a human hair. And I work on making particularly magnetite nanoparticles. So think of them as like really, really tiny magnets in a liquid. Um, there's a photograph there um, of, of what they look like, uh, both uh, in a bottle and under 30,000 times uh, magnification. So see, th these are particles I've synthesized, and they used they used in 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 healthcare, particularly because they're used injected into into patients, and they tend to bioaccumulate where tumors are. So normally, when patients undergo uh, MRI imaging for tumors which may be very uh, very mild or maybe on the onset, you you may not necessarily always see them. But if uh, these magnetic particles go in, go through the bloodstream, they tend to accumulate where there's a larger concentration of tissues. And so they light up like a Christmas tree when you put them um, in an MRI. And it makes it easier to diagnose these, can these, these tumors beforehand. At the same time, you can also kind of coat these particles with, with pharmaceuticals. So you can target where you really want this medication to go and minimize the sort of side effects that a patient might see. And from a more and in a more sort of industrial environment, these particles can also be used for hard drives and and liquid crystal displays on, on computers and mobile phones. So that's so that's those are the particles I make. Um, and how I go about it is is through a sort of greener synthetic route, which also shows kind of the breadth of of the chemical engineering process. So on the extreme left, you see an engineering drawing a schematic of of how I've thought of a reactor and how it might work. And, and this is actually the reactor I use in the laboratory. Uh, but it's not just this, so because we look at things from a system standpoint, we then develop um, a flow sheet, which is the, the photograph in the center on paper, just to try and understand how, uh, how these processes work and how to make sure that we, we feed everything in the flow rates that we want and maintain the temperature and pressure. And then we build this equipment and test it out and validate it and actually make the products that we want. Um, so on the extreme right is the reactor I've built uh, using using the two schematics um, that I had developed before. And this is sort of what chemical engineers, one of the things that chemical engineers do. But this is just a kind of broad understanding. And on this slide, there's a bit more about what uh, what other research themes people can do or what other research goes on in the chemical engineering department. Thank you, Path. Um, fascinating. I really love that idea of green chemical engineering. It wasn't something that I'd really um, thought about, I guess, before or knew that that was something that was um, happening. It, it, but it may, it's obvious now you've said it. Um, and obviously that's really important as we're all now really thinking about the environment and the yeah. future of the environment. Um, so.
I knew that um, you, you've got that list there, and I know mm. chemical engineering, um, you know, that you've been involved in upscaling production of drugs and vaccines and things like that. And it's interesting you talking about your iron oxide particles, which is what I'm mm. assuming you're doing. And it's interesting, yes. you know, you're talking about putting drugs on those. And yes. that's what we would refer to as nanomedicine. So if you ever yeah. hear that term nanomedicine, this is sort of delivering drugs with, with nanoparticles. And in, in my field of, of work, which is regenerative medicine, um, it's interesting we've been using those iron oxide particles. We can, um, because they're so, so tiny, um, you can use them to label cells. So for example, we would take stem cells and you might, I'm sure a lot of you will have heard about stem cell therapy and you're injecting stem cells into um, people. And when you do that, if you uh, load the stem cells with these iron oxide particles, you can use an MRI um, uh, system to see where they end up because we want to know or be sure that they go to the right site where we want them to have an action. So it's it's interesting how all these different, you know, scientists obviously use all the different technologies from all the different fields. Um, now, um, going back to that, you were mentioning on, on that slide, you've got sort of, you know, some quite biological applications. And this is where I wanted to introduce you to one of the other chemical engineering students that's um, doing a PhD in the Department of um, Chemical Engineering, and that's uh, Chloe. So, um, Chloe, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into to chemical engineering. Okay. I Chloe, you need to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Hi, <okay>. everyone. <laughs> um, great to be part of this. Um, so yes, as Sarah said, I did my undergraduate in chemical engineering um, and really just from looking at the subjects I enjoyed in school were mainly maths and chemistry. Um, and after doing some research of the universities and speaking to my teachers, I knew I didn't want to study pure maths. Um, as I wanted to do some more of the applications of it. So that led me to engineering. And then just having a look at the different types of engineering, I came down to chemical engineering, um, which I was very fortunate. I really enjoyed my undergraduate degree. Um, but I found I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do with the degree. And it was actually just towards the end in my final two years, I came across this application of using chemical engineering within the body um, and within biological systems. And that's what I'm doing for my PhD now. Right, so you chose engineering. Um, yeah, I guess for me, when, when I was starting out in, in my career or, or going to university, it was quite unusual for, for women to do engineering. So tell me, you know, for example, in your sort of chemical engineering when you're an undergraduate, what's the sort of ratio, male, females? Yep, so just now actually in the undergraduate department for chemical engineering, it's just over 40% females, um, which is really good. Okay. And within the my PhD now, I'm really fortunate to work underneath a brilliant female professor and more than 50% of my group are females. Um, so I'm working in a very good environment um, and we just want to encourage as many women to come into engineering to keep the numbers going in the right direction. Yeah, well, that's great. That is great. Um, so sorry for interrupting you, Chloe. Um, so you were going to tell us about your uh, your research project. That's what we're really interested in. Yes. So I'll show you a bit about what we can do. So one of the main things we study in chemical engineering is fluid dynamics, which is understanding how liquids and gases flow. So you might consider a normal application of this to be pumping oil from the ground and taking it to a transport plant. But actually, when we think about the body, it's the same system. We have your heart in the middle and this pumps around blood um, all around your body to make sure it gets to all your organs. So when we can look at different um, diseases, one disease I focus on, which you might have heard of, is aortic dissection. So this is when your aorta, which is the main artery that comes out of your heart, 
um, the wall of your aorta actually splits. So looking at the figure on the left here, um, you can see the main shape of the aorta, and that's what a healthy aorta would look like. But we have the second channel of blood flow on the right hand side called the false lumen. So there's more blood flowing actually within the wall of the aorta, which is undesirable as then the blood isn't reaching your organs. So things we can do as a chemical engineer is model how this blood flows, just as we would model how an oil flows in a pipe. Um, so one of my results you can see in the picture on the right. So this is looking at where the blood is going within the aorta and within the wall, how fast it's going. And that's important to understand for doctors to know how we should treat each patient. So there are a couple of different ways to treat um, this type of disease. And one way is to use a stent graft. Now you might have heard a stent graft used for unblocking arteries, maybe after someone's had a heart attack, but they can also be used to just provide support in your arteries. And in this care, it, in this case, sorry, it's used to cover up any tears in the walls to try and keep the blood flowing within the aorta, which is what we see in the picture on the left here. And in the middle, we can just see a picture of a stent graft. This one would be about three centimeters um, in diameter, so maybe a bit bigger than the type you'll have um, treating heart attacks. And one of my recent pieces of work was looking at for different patients, what's the preferable length of the stent graft? So this is the type of study we can do to really try and help doctors understand the best way to treat patients. So we have on the right, you can see two aortas again with the blood flow modeled. Um, and the gray, uh, the, sorry, the black curved line is just indicating the length of the stent graft. We were modeling different lengths to see what difference it would make. And we found that for certain patients, it might be beneficial to use a longer stent graft. So these are the type of things we can do to try and show the doctors potentially different ways of choosing the treatment. So another key part of chemical engineering is studying mass transfer and reaction engineering. Again, this typically might have been in a reactor, in a plant to create um, a chemical or a plastic. But actually, we use all these same principles again but to look at how your blood cells travel, how different cells within your body react together, and um, to predict biological reactions. So one example on the left here, we can predict where blood clots might form. And in some cases, it actually is beneficial for patients for this to occur if maybe there's too much bleeding. In another case, when you have blood clots that are unwanted, for example, in this middle case, here we have the arteries leading to the brain. And the yellow block in the middle is a blood clot that's cutting off blood to the brain, which would ultimately lead to a stroke. So in this case, what we're able to do is, again, model the blood flow within these arteries and model how a drug can be put into the blood, maybe through injection, and how this reacts with the blood clot to break it down, ultimately leading to blood flow back to the brain. And then finally, we can also look at how drugs can enter um, and distribute within cancer cells. So this is the image on the right. And we can see from this simulation, actually we found that the drug wasn't reaching the center of the cancer cell, um, which is obviously not beneficial as we want to make sure the cells are killed. So these types of simulations can help us um, tailor drugs or help uh, guide people in the design of drugs to make sure they're as effective as possible. So with all this engineering, you might not expect us to have a typical chemical engineer to have a relationship in the hospitals, but for to do this work, we work very closely with doctors and surgeons to make sure that all the work we're doing is appropriate and important in answering their questions. And they provide us with a lot of information to make sure our simulations are accurate. So here we just have a couple of um, examples of what we work with. So we have MRI scans um, on the left. You can see we can actually identify the tumor cell and be able to model that exact shape. Um, and on the right, um, I work a lot with CT scans. So you can see a CT scan here, which has allows us to extract a 3D model of the heart and the aorta to be able to model all the blood flowing within them. So hopefully that gives you a good overview of a very different type of chemical, chemical engineering application. Yeah, really interesting. Like, I, I didn't actually know that we had 
chemical engineers at Imperial studying blood flow. Um, but it, now you've explained it, it makes perfect sense. And also I think it's interesting, again, how you're using those computational skills. And um, for me personally, I was one of those people that couldn't stand the, the sight of blood. Um, so I knew that I never wanted to do medicine, but wanted to do something to um, that was sort of healthcare related. Um, and that's why I sort of took more, uh, I actually did pharmacology. But um, it's interesting how you can yeah, use engineering. And, and I think we're going to hear later again in these talks how other people from engineering are um, have sort of very medical and healthcare applications. So really interesting. And again, the other thing that you've been saying is, you know, your computing skills. So um, yesterday we were hearing from Esther, who's an immunologist, and she's using her computing skills in terms of analysing big data and big sets of patient data to look at bacterial infection in, and how that's associated with different types of lung disease. And so it's interesting, again, here how you're using computing skills in, in quite a different way. Um, and, and, and you still get to sort of do your maths which is your sort of first love. So that's that's great. And for those of you, just let me assure you, if you haven't done much um, computing in your sort of in school, then this is something that you will have opportunity to really skill up during your undergraduate in university. So you will get opportunity to learn as much computing as as you want. Essentially, if you want to get into programming, you can do that. Right. So um, Last but not least, I'm going to introduce you to Wen. So Wen, um, I gather, unlike the rest of us who've been working from home, you've actually been coming into the labs at Imperial to make hand, hand sanitizer during lockdown. So first of all, tell us what you normally do, because <laughs> it's not normally making hand sanitizer. What, what do you normally do in the department? Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Wen. Uh, I actually, I did my undergrad and PhD in chemical engineering at Imperial. Um, at the moment, um, one of my uh, research direction is about peptide synthesis. I hope some of you know peptide, which is polymer of amino acids, and we, we can actually make them to um, to be used for uh, antimicrobial uh, compounds. And in my case, actually, I make something. Uh, uh, a peptide which can be used as a hydrogel, so it can be used to heal wounds. Oh, and, wow. Yep, and you can see actually as a researcher, you don't just always stay at home or stay in the lab. Um, you actually also go out to talk to people, so you can see my picture. Uh, that's me in Lisbon attending a, a conference and having lunch with my um, supervisor. Nice. Well, the lunch looks good. Um, <laughs> so, um, Thank you. Thank you, Wen. And that's interesting that that has a regenerative medicine sort of application, because again, an area that I'm really interested in and a lot of other people doing work on um, wound healing and regenerative medicine. So um, as I said, you've been in the lab, you've been making um, sanit hand sanitizer, as has um, PATH. And I think you're going to actually tell us now um, the bit that we're all, that we've um, particularly interested in in terms of COVID-19 because we know that right at the um, beginning of this pandemic there were um, a problem. We all had problems trying to get enough hand sanitizer, and that was you know personal problem but really critical in the sort of healthcare settings. Um, the lack of hand sanitizer was was um, really concerning. So tell us you know how you got started on this project how it all came about and then how you actually make hand sanitizer. So, um, so Puff and I actually had the opportunity to, to work on uh, a hand sanitizer production project. Um, so we, because we have the engineering background um, so that we can try to use our knowledge to tackle a bigger problem like this. Um, Puff, do you mind to tell us how we actually make them? Sure. Um, so the World Health Organization has published a sort of recipe uh, for making hand sanitizer, which is it's a little bit different than the one that you normally get in in the store. Uh, it's more of a spray than it is a gel, uh, but it's available to you know the, the recipe is available to everybody. And what you need is um, ethanol, 
uh, which is ethyl alcohol, um, 80% by volume. You need uh, distilled water or basically pure water. So if you boil it, you have to let it cool down. Um, and that's the how much you need. Um, you need glycerol, which basically keeps um, it's, it's, it's basically glycerine and it keeps your hands moist so it doesn't keep drying your hands out. And you then need hydrogen peroxide, uh, which which has some nascent oxygen and that helps um, kill some more germs. So to, but the main sort of active ingredient here is is ethanol, and that's the one that's responsible for you know the sanitizing um, action. And what we what we did was when we realized um, as, as a department that we didn't have or that the NHS didn't really have enough sanitizer. We had a we had a call out for for donations uh, on Twitter, so both to the department and within Imperial and to the larger sort of Twitter community. And uh, a lot of departments across Imperial kind of donated whatever excess solvents or chemicals which they had in in unopened bottles. And uh, we then came to the conclusion that we had most of the other chemicals in the right proportions, but we were running out of ethanol, which is which is a solvent uh, and, um, and 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 then that was kind of what was limiting us to make it at a larger scale. We received groups from the Science Museum as well, but the biggest kind of difference was made when Sipsmith, which is a local London gin distiller, uh, donated a thousand liters a week of the ethanol they would have otherwise used to make their gin, but to us so that we could make uh, sanitizer for the NHS and care homes. And so we went from like a really, really tiny kind of scale uh, for, for, for a lab where we were making maybe 10 or 15 or 20 liters uh, to where we were making um, thousands of liters. And on the next slide, you will kind of see the, the scale at which we were we were operating. So then what we had to do was we, we had to mix everything into these big containers and the yellow, um, the yellow thing that you see that's on the on the on the lid is is a pump to to sort of recirculate everything so it mixes well and that everything is homogeneous because that's really important. At a small scale, it's very easy. You know, you just put it in a bottle and you give it a shake. Uh, but when you start scaling things up, it doesn't quite work the same way. So you need to think about pumps and and then you also need to. Uh, work out and you need to make sure that the quality of product you are producing is reliable. And so that that part uh, for that part, I'd like to go back over to when uh, because he's he was kind of in charge of it. Thank you, Puff. Um, so I would guess a lot of you might think about making hand sanitizer about mixing things, mixing them together. And what we actually have to do um, also before we send it out to hospitals and care homes is that we have to check the quality. So I hope that uh, most of you have got to the Mentimeter uh, oh, using using when, the just, latest code. Mm -hmm. Just to say, I think that's the wrong number on the when on the Mentimeter. I think that's the old code. So yep. um, what's the, the latest code? Do you, do you know? Um, um, it's it's two eight one eight three nine. Yeah. Yep. Two eight one eight three nine. OK, so I hope that everyone is on the Mentimeter.com. And let me repeat, it's 281839. So before we send out the ethanol to, to the, or the hand sanitizers to the, to the care homes, uh, we have to check the quality. So essentially, like what Puff said, um, the ethanol content, because that is the main uh, ingredient. So now is the test time. Uh, what do you think are the suitable ways to test the quality of the hand sanitizer? You have four options. When, uh, one is the flame test, B, density, C, taste test, and D, chromatography. And you can choose more than one um, answers. Okay. Um, you don't have to think too much, uh, just use your instinct. It should be more than enough. Okay, let's, let's wait for uh, 10 seconds. So I can, can give you a hint. So if you can see the picture, that's me uh, using a, a machine. And that machine uh, is based on one of the uh, test methods. OK, so let's let's go to the next slide and see 
the, the response. So great, thanks for participating. So we have about uh, close to 30 people responding. OK, and, and I'm quite glad that uh, um, all of you have avoided the obvious, obviously wrong answer, which is the taste test. Um, the hand sanitizer is definitely non-toxic, but uh, we cannot use our um, tongue to, to determine the exact composition of the ethanol. OK, thank you. OK, we have more people now. OK, so just another five seconds before I disclose the, the right answers. OK, yep, thank you guys. So um, I, I although a lot of people uh, choose flame tests as one of the suitable one. Uh, unfortunately, we don't use it uh, in this application. So flame test is more useful for qualitative analysis uh, to determine certain uh, the existence of uh, certain uh, elements. Uh, but in our case, we want to have quantitative analysis as well as qualitative one. So we use both density, which is answer B, and chromatography. OK, in, in our case. So in the next slide, I will show you the, the machine that we use. So on the left hand side, it is the density measurement machine. So basically you inject the sample into the machine and uh, there is a tube, uh, sample tube within the machine which will vibrate. And based on the amplitude of vibration, uh, the, uh, the density can be calculated. The one on the right hand side is a chromatography machine and it can be it is very useful because it gives you both qualitative and quantitative uh, results you can see the see the result on top okay you can see uh, uh, two major peaks on top the one the peak on the right hand side is the ethanol peak and uh, the y axis is um, corresponds to the refractive index measurement and the the peak in the middle uh, Refer is the uh, glycerol uh, peak. So you can see that we can actually do the qualitative analysis. And in terms of quantitative analysis, all we need to do is to integrate the peak area uh, for, for these two peaks, and then we can determine how much material uh, are in the sample. OK, so thank you. So um, Thank you, Wen. Thank you, Path. So, and also, really, um, you know, thank you for, for telling us about how you're doing it, but also, really, thank you for the time that you've spent um, making that. So, you're obviously, you know, key workers um, because you're you're helping us um, provide all that um, really essential hand sanitizer. I'm just asking um, one question, though. I know, you know, as a, as a as a keen sort of gin gin drinker. Um, I know one of the sort of key elements of gin is sort of the botanicals that you add to it. And um, I've actually um, had Sipsmith's chocolate orange gin. So I'm just wondering if you're thinking at all about making any sort of scented hand sanitizers or anything like that, branching out a bit? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, you, yeah, um, we are actually planning to use one of the um, uh, flavoured um, Jean for the hand sanitizer, but we will only use it within our college um, because we want to keep the purest material uh, to the hospitals and care homes. But definitely, we are we are planning planning to do it in a few weeks' time. Great! I'm I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to that. Um, yeah. So, in terms of of questions, Marguerite is telling us that um, nobody has any questions. You've uh, made everything really clear. Um, and obviously, we'd also like to uh, acknowledge the, um, you know, Sipsmith, obviously, for providing all that ethanol for, to help us um, make this um, hand sanitizer. And also to all the other people in, in the Department of Chemical Engineering, because I know you're, you're on the uh, checking the um, composition of the, the product um, uh, when, but I know um, lots of other people have been involved in this. Um, so great and thank you. 
So um, if there are no questions, um, no, I'm not seeing any questions. So um, given that there's no questions, I'm going to um, leave it for today. Um, thank you um, to Chloe, Path, Wen and um, Margarita for um, joining us today, letting, um, letting us giving an insight into what chemical engineering is. Um, we're going to be back again next week on Wednesday for the third um, lockdown lesson. And in this lesson, we're going to go back to biomedical sciences and we'll be hearing from scientists that have started to look at the genomic response to the virus. Um, right, so right at the end now in the chat, we're just putting a little um, survey. If you can answer this survey, it would be great. It's super quick. It just gives us some feedback on what you think about these lockdown lessons. So until that, thank you for joining us and goodbye for now. See you guys. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.